Division One is now in session. Good morning. Be seated. Yes. Good morning. Now is the time, as they say, for oral argument in cause number one CACV. 16-0378, Smith & Wesson versus, is it the Worcester or the Wooster, or how do they pronounce that? The Wooster, the, at least I pronounce it that way. Works for me. I think we all uh, are probably already doing that, so thank you. Um, for everybody's information, these proceedings are being both audio and video recorded, so uh, as we say, barring any unforeseen circumstances, you ought to be able to see yourself on YouTube in a couple of weeks. I think that uh, since I first wrote these notes down, it's probably a couple of days at this point, but, but it will be available on YouTube soon. Um, council, each side will be given the standard 20 minutes uh, to, to uh, argue their position, and we would ask that you respect that time period. The timer located on the podium will let you know how much time you have left, and for the appellant's benefit, if you wish to reserve any portion of your 20 minutes for rebuttal, please let us know so that we can avoid taking up all your time, which, why would we do that, right? Um, however, ultimately, your reserving of rebuttal time is, is entirely up to you. We have reviewed the briefs. We have conferenced the case. We are well of the, of the, of the facts and the issues that are attendant to the argument, and we always tell people that so that you don't spend more time belaboring the facts, if you will, than making your argument if you've got an argument that, that is, is, is really a decisive, uh, decisively stated. Um, Council, when you come to the podium, I'd ask that you state your name and who you represent. And with that, ma'am. Do we have the sign-in sheet? Thank you, Casey. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes, Your Honor. Would you give us your name and, and go for it? My name is Araceli Rodriguez, and I am arguing today on behalf of Appellant The Worcester uh, doing business as airsplat.com uh, and I would like to reserve uh, five minutes of my time for rebuttal, Your Honors. The Worcester respectfully requests that this court find that the Superior Court erred in exercising personal jurisdiction over the Worcester. Uh, the Superior Court's decision to exercise jurisdiction was erroneous for three reasons. One, uh, and first and foremost, the Worcester did not purposefully fully avail itself of the privileges of conducting business in Arizona. So Arizona courts could not properly exercise specific jurisdiction over the appellant. Second, appellee uh, Smith & Wesson failed to make a prima facie showing of personal jurisdiction. And third, the Superior Court improperly accepted the jurisdiction, jurisdictional allegations in Smith & Wesson's complaint as true. Ma'am, yes. how did the federal matter that preceded all this come to be in the federal district court? I believe, Your Honor, that Smith and Wesson filed a suit against my client and numerous um, defendants for uh, various uh, claims involving a patent infringement and things of the like. So there may well have been a, a an Arizona attached party to that action. So Arizona had, uh, uh, so the federal courts had jurisdiction in regard to that matter because of that party. Perhaps, Your Honor, I'm not too familiar with the facts or the other defendants in that case, but that may as well have been the reason why Smith & Wesson filed in Arizona District Court. Thank you. Additionally, Your Honors, the Worcester respectfully requests that you find that the Superior Court abused its discretion in failing to find that Mr. Kinsey's actions were the result of excusable neglect. Uh, the Superior Court was erroneous in its finding for two reasons. First, system failures like the one that occurred in this case are the result of excusable neglect. And two, Mr. Kinsey was diligent in handling the crash. Uh, with regards to personal jurisdiction and purposeful availment, uh, 
The Western did not purposefully avail itself of the privileges of doing business in the state. Uh, as the record indicates, the Worcester has no meaningful contacts, ties, or relationship or relations with the forum. Now, For, Council, the, the record that would reveal that would come from your motion to dismiss, correct? Yes, Your Honor, and um, the motion to dismiss and the uh, the the uh, the issue was that some of the allegations in the complaint were one of the issues is the allegations in the complaint of uh, Pelly were accepted as true, and so yes, uh, for our facts, you would have what was submitted in our motion to dismiss as to the personal jurisdiction. Um, Mr. Kinsey later filed a motion for enlargement of time for the motion to dismiss, and that had uh, attached to it an affidavit by Mr. Kinsey himself, and that is uh, the facts that we're alluding to as to the excusable, excusable neglect issue. Well, I, I just, I, I'm hoping that you, you're, with the outline you've presented, you'll be able to sort of focus on the difference there may be between a, a positive finding that your client didn't purposely engage, whatever the language is, mm -hmm. as opposed to were there was the complaint deficient in its jurisdictional uh, averments? Because you believe both We believe be true, both, right? Your Honor, um, as to the... Uh, we we believe that there were that my client did not have sufficient the uh, minimum contacts required under uh, uh, Arizona law and the due process clause of the Constitution. But my point and, is, it seems like the way the record reveals that is through untimely motions that you filed. So if you don't get those get past that untimeliness issue, then that stuff's not available for consideration. Correct. That, then you're reverting to the question. What does the complaint have to have in it? Correct, Your Honor. So I can discuss the um, excusable neglect issues if you'd like, since that, um, that the, the reason both issues are raised on appeal is because we understand that they're connected. Well, I, I guess let me get to my point. Okay. <laughs> is it possible that your, your motion was untimely, you weren't entitled to a motion for enlargement, your affidavit uh, doesn't come in, and yet the court may review the complaint itself and determine its sufficiency in terms of jurisdictional allegations. Yes, Your Honor. If 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 the court only had in front of it the facts as alleged in the complaint, um, all that is alleged in the complaint is that my client has a website and that there was a district court case that was that resulted in a settlement agreement that was subsequently breached by my client and that because there was a district court case in Arizona that was subsequently settled uh, that was sufficient contacts with the state of Arizona to confer jurisdiction on to, uh, to the state of my client number one uh, the superior the superior court uh, relied on uh, Rule 8 of the Arizona Rules of Civil Procedure to find that the uh, complaint, that it had to accept the uh, jurisdictional facts uh, alleged in uh, Smith & Wesson's complaint as true. But that, that rule seems to only apply where you have actually filed a responsive pleading and you have failed to rebut factual allegations. Correct, Your Honor. So now we're moving to the actual facts in the in the complaint of Smith and Wesson, the website. We do not believe, it, the law clearly shows that uh, the existence of a website by itself is not sufficient to confer jurisdiction of a state court onto a non-resident defendant who puts up a website that uh, the entire United States can, can access. There are, Effectively, jurisdiction would be everywhere if that were the case. Correct, okay. and the complaint only states that we have a website, that my client has a website, DBA, which is dbaairsplat.com. It does not allege that my client sold X amount of guns or ammo through the website. It does not allege that, you know, X number of Arizonans accessed the website. It does not allege any of that. It only alleges that the website exists. It also alleges that, um, 
the website exists and that the settlement agreement was sufficient to com the existence of the settlement uh, agreement and my client's uh, purported breach of the same is was enough to uh, confer jurisdiction onto Arizona courts, which we vehemently argue is not the case. What was there about the settlement agreement that made it confer jurisdiction? It, it, it's a settlement agreement. Right. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. What was there about the settlement agreement that said, okay, Arizona is the place? First, Smith and Wesson's argument. One of the end parties that entered the settlement agreement has a place of business in Arizona. Not a principal place of business, a place of business. That's one of their argument, one of their facts. Number two, it alleges that the uh, breach of the settlement agreement somehow because it resulted from a case that was filed in Arizona District Court uh, was conduct that my client directed to Arizona which the case law clearly shows, Your Honors, Your Honors, that the unilateral activities of plaintiffs are not, which result in, uh, which result in non-resident defendants sending contacts, sending communications to the forum are not sufficient to confer jurisdiction. If a non-resident defendant is responding to, uh, to Requests for information, calls, faxes, whatever that are unilater that result unilaterally from defend from the plaintiff, that is not sufficient to confer personal jurisdiction of Arizona courts onto non-resident de defendants. There has to be that pur purposeful availment, which is purposeful conduct directed at the foreign state w that could lead a court to believe that the non-resident expected, could expect that it could be hauled into court there, that it could uh, uh, benefit from the protections and laws of that forum state. And this case is absent of any facts showing that my client purposefully availed itself of the privileges of conducting business in Arizona. There's a website and there's a breach settlement agreement. The settlement agreement didn't contain a jurisdiction or venue provision for remedies. Is that your recollection? I, I believe so. I don't, I don't think it did, Your Honor. Um, the other issue with this, or the other issue we see with the settlement agreement and its uh, inability to confer jurisdiction onto Arizona courts is that under the settlement agreement, uh, under the settlement agreement, the Worcester was not required to do anything in Arizona, there's a case, I believe. In fact, counsel, the payments were to be delivered in Pennsylvania and the items in Massachusetts are perhaps All East Coast. Reversed. Okay. Lawyers and entities, or lawyers and offices in either Pennsylvania or Massachusetts. Nothing was, none of the payments were, they were written out to uh, Smith and Wesson, but they were, the payments and the return of that inventory was supposed to be returned to state, states in the East Coast, not Arizona, just because that settlement agreement resulted from a district court case in Arizona where my client was sued in a group of defendants, some of which may have been enough to, uh, may have given that court enough jurisdiction, enough, um, contacts, may have provided enough contacts to give that court jurisdiction doesn't mean that this court now or Arizona courts in general now can exercise jurisdiction over this particular non-resident defendant. Counsel, yeah, so and again, we're on de novo review, and, and you agree that the sole question is specific jurisdiction, not general jurisdiction. Yes, Your Honor. And I'll ask your counterpart the same question. But um, in looking at the minute entry, it looks like the Superior Court found that there would not, on, based on the record, absent the default, that there wouldn't be a sufficient showing to exercise personal jurisdiction, and that exercising personal jurisdiction, again, absent the default, would not be reasonable or just. Um, but then there was the default, uh, and that caused the court to, um, to change uh, its conclusion uh, or to to come to the conclusion that results in this appeal help me understand your argument better about why the accepting is true the well pleaded factual allegations in the complaint just don't cross that line just don't show jurisdiction well rule 8 as one of your colleagues mentioned is a rule that it it's in the, I think the pleading section of the rules of civil procedure and it discusses averments in a pleading and what the consequences of are if you do not 
um, admit or deny said uh, um, statements in a pleading. The notes, the history, the case, the, I think most of the case law, if all, if not all of the case law that I've read, does not discuss personal jurisdiction in the context of Rule 8. The cases cited by opposing counsel uh, mentioning Rule 8, they are about, one of them is about the, the Superior Court, the Supreme Court of Arizona, um, clarifying that, uh, that Arizona was not, uh, ditching, uh, or notice pleading for, uh, in light of the U.S. Supreme Court's recent decision in Twombly. And the second one was just about, you know, allegations in the complaint must be accepted as true. And my argument is, even if you accept the allegations as true in the complaint, if you, they just don't confer jurisdiction onto Arizona courts. Well, what if the complaint, instead of, I think your argument is, well, the complaint here says it alleges there's jurisdiction, then it gives a couple of purported reasons for that, and you say the purported reasons don't, don't pass muster. Correct. What if the complaint just said there is specific jurisdiction in this case, and then there's no effectual response to that? Can, can that be deemed admitted? No, Your Honor, because if that were the case, then an uh, uh, in-state plaintiff could file suit, allege, allege uh, personal jurisdiction without any supporting facts in the complaint, maybe not even properly serve that complaint on defendant, and if the defendant fails to respond for X reason, you would automatically be granted a personal jurisdiction based on that allegation. So, so that would suggest that there's, there would be some, some level of, of uh, scrutiny that a court must do, even of an unopposed allegation of special jurisdiction. Correct, Your Honor. Is that because of the due process implications? Yes, Your Honor. I mean, we're going back to Penoyer versus Neff. I think that's exactly what happened in that case. There is, and it might not be as astringent a duty as with subject matter jurisdiction, where you must analyze your, you know, whether you have just ju subject matter jurisdiction or over a case at any point. But perhaps, you know, before. I, I don't know, I cannot answer when that duty arises and when it should end, but I do argue that, we do argue that there should be a duty, and your honors, I'm at the five minute mark. Let me ask you one question, I'll we'll give you a few extra seconds. Are, is what Judge Thompson has asked you about, is that the difference between a pled fact and a well-pled fact? I would argue yes, your honor, and what his example was, yeah, it was not a fact. I would argue that it was a legal conclusion unsupported by any factual support and unsupported by any facts. Thank you. You're welcome. Casey, would you take the clock back to five minutes for appellant, please? And we're very equanimical here, counsel. So if I do the same thing to you, we'll add some time to you. Okay, as well. I appreciate that, Your Honor. And to answer a question that you had earlier, uh, there were no Arizona defendants in the uh, underlying federal court litigation. There were defendants from uh, Texas, Virginia, and California. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, it's Craig Hoffman on behalf of uh, Smith & Wesson Corp. and Smith & Wesson Holding Corp. Uh, I'll start with a quote from uh, Judge Hurwitz in the uh, Planning Group of Scottsdale case. Uh, quote, we confront a topic that's vexed generations of law students and judges alike, determining whether the due process clause of the 14th Amendment permits a state to court to exercise personal jurisdiction over non-resident defendants. And I think that's the threshold issue that we have to address is personal jurisdiction. And if you, your honors agree that there is personal jurisdiction, we can move on to the inquiry as to whether or not uh, defendant's conduct was uh, excusable neglect versus mere carelessness. Now, I know your honors are asking questions about whether or not uh, our allegations are uh, with respect to specific jurisdiction versus uh, general jurisdiction. This is a specific jurisdiction case. Um, and as your honors recognized, what happened here was the trial court initially concluded that it did not have personal jurisdiction, and then because the motion to dismiss was not filed in a timely manner, it accepted the act allegations of the complaint as true, and then effectively reversed its conclusion. But at the time that he made the findings that there really shouldn't be a jurisdiction, was he aware of the untimeliness then, or did he find that out later? It's a little perplexing that he it has is. this finding and then... It is. I mean, he just as easily could have ruled without addressing the personal jurisdiction issue 
untimely, therefore all allegations are true, and therefore, but, you know. But it isn't that he deemed there was no jurisdiction, then found, then discovered that the motion to dismiss was untimely. No, he, he, he did them both simultaneously. And what what is a little bit candidly inconsistent in the court's ruling is if you enter a judgment without personal jurisdiction, it's void. And so your honors have to conclude that there's personal jurisdiction in order to affirm. Um, and I'd like to address why we think we adequately pled personal jurisdiction. Can I ask, and I want to hear from you on that, okay. on that, because that is kind of the nub of this, but is it that the court was required, given the default, to accept all allegations as true or merely the well-pleaded factual allegations? You don't have to accept naked legal conclusions. It's only the, the well-pled factual allegations. And it, uh, so that's, that's the answer to that question. Thank you. Um, with respect to our factual allegations, it's not limited to the words that are in the complaint itself. We also have several exhibits of the complaint, including the settlement agreement, which, again, stemmed from allegations in federal court that defendant infringed on my client's intellectual property rights by selling uh, items into commerce here in Arizona. So, okay, so we're back to Judge Thomas' earlier question then. Are you then uh, – he, he asked you if there was any kind of a uh, – uh, within the settlement agreement, if there was any kind of a jurisdictional uh, – agreement reached in regard to any subsequent litigation? There's clearly not a, there's not a clause in the settlement agreement that says you have to resolve all disputes under the settlement agreement under Arizona, nor is there a provision that says it's supposed to apply in any other jurisdiction. So I would argue you'd have to look to the settlement agreement as a whole, and it may be appropriate to resolve a dispute regarding the settlement agreement in multiple jurisdictions. Now, the settlement agreement, as I mentioned earlier, was a settlement of an allegation that defendants were infringing on my client's property rights by selling items into commerce here in Arizona. Where would we get that from the record that we have? It's not in the record, Your Honor, although it's a public record, so therefore you could take judicial notice. But there's been no request we do that, and the trial court did not do that. No, the trial court did not get to that level of scrutiny. Um, now, the settlement agreement itself says that uh, defendants are obligated to pay my clients uh, I believe it's six payments over a period of seven or over a period of five months, forty thousand dollars in total. And the, uh, my clients are listed as a Nevada company with its place of business here in Arizona, and a I believe it's a Massachusetts company, or I'm sorry, a Delaware company with its principal place of business in Massachusetts. So there's an ongoing financial relationship contemplated between, among others, a company that has its place of business in Arizona with defendants. Now. But you're not suggesting that Smith & Wesson's place of business is going to establish jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction here on behalf of the appellant. Well, if there's an obligation to pay an entity that has a place of business in a jurisdiction, then there's an ongoing financial relationship between, say, the defendant and my clients, and that could subject them to personal jurisdiction in Arizona pursuant to the Scottsdale planning case. Even if the tender is to be made in a different state? Well, the tender was made to an agent for my clients. So it was made, it was made to their attorney, so it doesn't matter if the attorney is located in Nevada or, or, or Pennsylvania or wherever it may be, it, it, it was simply an agent for a principal, and it's the location of the principal that's important. Is, is the agency relationship clear from the settlement agreement? It is. It's, it's, it, was, it, it was sent to the counsel of record for the underlying litigation in federal court, and her name's Hera Jacobs, and her name is listed in, in the settlement agreement. And the delivery, weren't there some items that needed to be returned? Those right. were sent to an eastern state as those well? Those were sent to the offices in Massachusetts, not to, not to the agent. Was, those were sent directly to one of the parties to the settlement agreement. But the payments themselves were made to an agent, and the agent is an agent for multiple principals, one of whom has a place of business here in Arizona. So... We're looking at specific personal jurisdiction, and under the um, case law, including the planning group of Scottsdale case law, it holds it voluntarily entering into a contract that creates an ongoing relationship with an Arizona entity is sufficient to create personal jurisdiction. And that's through its detailed examination of the Burger King case from the United States Supreme Court. Yeah, so I don't mean to belabor, but the payments go to Smith & Wesson Corp., right? Uh, I believe so, but in... in well, and, grab my of course, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm endeavoring to read from that document, so I'm, I'm trying to get it right. But that's a Delaware corporation with its principal place of business and, in Massachusetts. And if I could pile on, pile. Is, is having to pay somebody having a relationship? Uh, under the planning group of Scottsdale case, it is, Your Honor. Um, that case dealt with uh, was effectively a loan from an Arizona company who was to be paid back from a California company, and those payments were to be sent back to Arizona. And importantly, in that case, they cited to a case from uh, the Third Circuit called Mellon Bank versus uh, Farino, which is 960 F2D 
1217 from 1992. And under both cases, the court noted that it was known by the defendant, effectively, that it was dealing with a company from the forum state. They negotiated and corresponded with that company and agreed to make periodic payments to that company. And those three facts were sufficient both in Scottsdale planning and in the third sector case cited therein. And my only point in asking that, you're right, that one of the two parties on, on your side of the settlement agreement has a, uh, an office in Arizona, but the party that got the money was a, the other party. Right, but, Your Honor, Smith, Smith & Wesson Holding Company is a parent company for a subsidiary. So right. I, I don't know that it's really a distinction that makes a difference. I'm sort of guessing they treat each other very, very – S separately for corporate purposes. Perhaps. I, candidly, that's nowhere in the record, and, and I don't know I'd for sure. I'd be stunned if they didn't. Right. How about that? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have time to go through the settlement agreement in detail at this point. If I understand. You're, if you're saying that the payments are directed to Smith & Wesson Holding but, Co. But the settlement was a settlement of litigation, right? Correct. And is the Scottsdale planning case, wasn't that a contractual undertaking? Correct. And, and we're dealing with, with the same, th well, it was a contractual undertaking that, form the basis of the arguments about jurisdiction, and that's the same thing I'm arguing here, is that it's the settlement agreement, a contractual relationship which creates... Right, but it's a, it's a settlement of, a, of legal claims as opposed to... In other words, if I contract with people in a commercial setting, I could see that creating a relationship that might uh, uh, involve jurisdictional uh, considerations. But when, just because you settle a lawsuit, it's doesn't seem to be the same level of, uh, of uh, committing to a, a, a relationship. relationship yeah. Well, I, you know, respectfully, Your Honor, I, I see I, the, I the commonality to, yeah. is it's, there's an agreement. Right. I mean, I, I've settled lots of cases, and it's, it's always a business decision, as all contracts are. And I don't think that there's a meaningful distinction between a settlement of a piece of litigation versus a contract that's entered into just because – People had a disagreement and decided to work it out via contract. I'm not sure that there is there's a meaningful distinction between the two. Counsel, don't I'm talking about the difference between parties that have agree to have contracts to do commercial things, and people have contracts to settle litigation. Right, and, and it, uh, there's been distinctions made between the standard for uh, specific personal jurisdiction and tort case between tort cases and contract cases, but Arizona courts have rejected that that distinction in the Scottsdale planning case, and Candidly, the, the standard for obtaining specific personal jurisdiction is easier under a tort standard in other jurisdictions rather than a contract standard. It's simply, it's the effects test effectively. So if someone commits a tort and the effects are felt here, then it's easier to establish personal jurisdiction. So if we're taking that to its logical conclusion, we're settling a tort claim by entering into a contract. So arguably it should be easier than just a pure contract situation to establish specific personal jurisdiction here. That brings us to the uh, the affidavit of Kenneth Wu, uh, and your honors, I, I don't I don't think that's necessarily relevant to what you have to decide today. What Ke Kenneth Wu disputed, and again, this is you can consider it if you assume that we're going to consider things that after uh, the default was entered. But what he said is we don't do direct business directly in Arizona. But what our contention is with respect to specific personal jurisdiction has very little to do with whether or not they have a website. I mean, the, the underlying website and the sale of items into commerce in Arizona formed the basis for the lawsuit, which was eventually settled. But you know, our specific personal jurisdiction argument is based upon the settlement agreement and not the existence of the website. And so <clears throat> I guess the ultimate question that I would be asking me is, where did Judge Gamma err? And if you look to his ruling, he focused on the notion that uh, defend is not doing business in Arizona and that we were purportedly attempting to establish jurisdiction solely by virtue of the underlying federal case. And that's just not true. He didn't examine anywhere in his ruling the settlement agreement, what the obligations were, whether or not they created an ongoing obligation between the parties. What he focused on was the underlying federal court lawsuit and the notion of whether or not defendants are doing business there. So I think it, a detailed examination of the settlement agreement and the party's obligations they're under and the fact that it creates a month's log obligation to make periodic payments to an Arizona company is something that is sufficient to establish jurisdiction under the Scottsdale planning case. Counsel, let me ask you, what you're, you're basically suggesting, suggesting the trial court didn't consider the settlement agreement. It, it certainly didn't make its way into the order. There's no and, analysis and of it. And I understand that, and it, 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 it is what, what it is. Um, but how are we to sort of intuit 
that the court ignored that document that's Exhibit A to your complaint? Well, I think that's probably implicit in the, in the notion that you guys get to do de novo review. You get to review the entire record and to determine from the entire record before you whether or not it is sufficient. So I don't think there's any uh, obligation for you to assume that Judge Gamut decide, or, uh, relied upon everything or considered everything. Uh, you're entitled to rely on everything uh, that's in the record before you under de novo review. And if I heard you correctly, and I want to make sure I understand this correctly, y your view is that the website that defendant had is not relevant to jurisdictional purposes, or did does that? I, I'm not looking to misstate your argument. I no, just it, want to understand. It. It's a little more subtle than that. So okay. the specific personal jurisdiction argument that we're making. Subtlety. Very, <laughs> well, it, it stems from the fact that we entered in the settlement agreement, and the genesis of the settlement agreement was the fact that the allegations, at least in the federal court lawsuit, that they were using their website to put items into commerce in Arizona that impacted my client's intellectual property rights. So. The underlying genesis is is the website, but for purposes of this specific personal jurisdiction analysis, the, the more, I guess, appropriate focus would be the settlement agreement itself. Are, are we extending that notion of, of, of where you're subject to personal jurisdiction if you're a defendant that doesn't do business but in one state, but you do it over the Internet, that all 50 states where you may distribute product to are subject to so we can all spend a few weeks in Hawaii trying to work up a settlement? It would, be, it would be nice. Unfortunately, that's sort of beyond what, what my allegations are and, and what I think is before the court. But my understanding of, of that law, area of law is, number one, it's been developing over the course of the past 10 years. And, and number two, uh, I think it's a more specific inquiry than whether or not you are merely selling items into commerce in a, in a given state. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's necessarily before your honors today. Could this have been avoided by a additional paragraph in the settlement agreement that sort of told everybody where, if things went south, um, jurisdiction would be exercised? I mean, candidly, yeah. If there was a provision in there that says all disputes regarding the settlement agreement were resolved in Arizona, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in front of you, I don't think. Um, but I think that's right, although I don't know, and that's not this case. Obviously. Right. But again, Your Honors, just because there's, there's not a provision in there that says you have to address this in Arizona doesn't necessarily mean that you can't address it in I, Arizona. And I understand. Yeah, okay. I understand. Uh, moving on to, unless your honors have any more questions about personal jurisdiction, um, I can move on to the whole notion of uh, abuse of discretion versus excusable neglect. Uh, again, uh, what's important here, I think, is the, the, the standard of review, which is abuse of discretion. Uh, and you have to find that Judge Gamma was effectively way out of bounds. Uh, and I don't want to, I guess, pepper you guys with the facts, but uh, the response to the complaint was due originally on uh, December 9th. The default, we filed an application for entry default. The default became effective uh, on uh, December 29th. So there was a period of, I believe it's 17 days in between those dates where they could have put in the response of pleading. And they had all the information to do it as of December 21st. That's when they got the affidavit of Kenneth Wood that was attached to the motion to dismiss. The motion to dismiss was not a complex document. It's three pages. It cited one case. So they could have filed that on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, even the 28th, and they didn't do so. And the only time they say that there was a hurdle for them filing it was on the 28th, which is the absolute last day uh, before default became effective. And, you know, Your Honors, I, I left for this I work about a mile and a half away. I left for this hearing an hour ago because things happen, cars break down. It, it's, it, you have to consider the fact that life sometimes gets in the way. You have a sick kid. You can have a computer breakdown. It happens, unfortunately, all the time. There's malware. There's viruses. It's just something that you have to build into what you do when you practice law. And it's not, it's dangerous not to file a response once uh, an application for entry of default has been filed. It is downright reckless to wait until the final day to do so because things like this happen. And so, Your Honor, I don't think that uh, the record before you is sufficient for you to conclude that Judge Gamma uh, abused his discretion in concluding that uh, defendant's failure to respond in a timely manner was due to uh, anything other than carelessness rather than excusable neglect. If you have any questions in that regard, I'm happy to answer them. If not, I can yield the remainder of my time. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. You. Your Honors, the deadline to file that motion to dismiss in this case was not the 21st, 22nd, or 23rd. It was the 28th. 
of December. And a lot of people, I mean, it's strategy. A lot of us wait until the last day to file a pleading. And it's counsel, that's fair. But when you're facing a, a filing for entry of default, you do so at your peril. Okay, Your Honor. There's. I, I mean, I, I had had the judge set the entry of default aside, I don't think there's anything for us to see for the same reason I'm not convinced that there's anything for us to see because he didn't. Mm -hmm. But entry of default I view as somewhat different than the original deadline. Entry of default is that grace period, something that doesn't exist in federal court. Uh, and to get, uh, you know, a notice of entry of default and then, and I won't say simply, but then to docket it for the response date and then miss that date by a day is a risky proposition. I understand that, Your Honor. And I under I know that the 10 day per grace period was put in by the rules because in the past there was no notice requirement when you end when you filed that motion for entry of default. But Osterkamp, the case does not say that this 10 day rule is a blanket cutoff date. It does the case does discuss that in cases of excusable neglect it you may, there may be an opportunity for uh, the deadline to be extended when a uh, response is not filed within the 10 10 day 10 day period the case is clear and i know that you know the 10 day period was put in there to um a provide notice and also to uh it it resulted in um sorry to use such a colloquial term, but to provide, you know, less slack <laughs> to attorneys for when they fail to file deadlines. But in this case, it was excusable neglect, the fact that uh, Mr. Kinsey did not file that, that document on the 28th. He already had the affidavit of of Mr. Wu in hand, that's dated the 21st. He had already started filing the, or preparing the motion. The computer crashed. We have to file things electronically here. We are in Yuma. May I remind you? I drove, I am, we are a little Yuma firm. We don't, we cannot just, we're not one block from the Maricopa County Superior Court. I understand. <laughs> and that's the beauty of electronic filing. And so we that. are entirely dependent on electronic filing. Right. For, for the Superior Court of Maricopa County. We, uh, and as the affidavit in, included in our motion for, um, expand, or, yeah, motion for extension of time, M Mr. Kinsey properly alleged that there was a complete system failure, which number one, <clears throat> didn't remind him of the deadline, uh, uh, like remind him of the deadline. And may I remind you also, your honors, this was the 28th of December. So then there was the last legal holiday, the last legal day, to work had been, or the last working day had been three days prior to that because Christmas was on the 25th. And it's, a, it's a busy and a hectic yes, time. Yes, right. And I understand that. But couldn't the trial court properly conclude that by not getting it on file, you know, in a timely fashion in the week plus after the 21st of December, um, that that was not um, cause to set aside the entry of default? No, Your Honor. The cases and this rule exist for for instances and fact patterns that are unavoidable, which was un, this was an unavo unavoidable situation. Oh, and I understand if you look at from the 28th forward, it may have been. But couldn't the Superior Court properly look at the week between the 21st and the 28th and say, you know, this was entirely avoidable? Between the 21st and the 27th, maybe, if the deadline had been on the 27th, but the deadline was on the 28th, and that's when the computer was not up and running. Not only the computer, but also the Internet. So it was... But doesn't that argument assume that that time really starts clicking one day before the deadline as opposed to about 20 days before the deadline? Yes, Your Honor, and that and the 10... The the entry of default is not you know one day before the deadline. It's the day of the deadline, and that's when the well, that's when the shutdown and the crisis occurred in the office. So I don't know that it's proper to be looking at days before the deadline to see what could have been done. If anything, it's after the deadline where the and your honors, I'm out of time. Go ahead and finish your thought, please. 
it, the cases, if anything, uh, the case line Arizona focuses on what happens after the deadline. Attorneys filing the pleading one to five days after the deadline versus f filing 30 days after the deadline. They look at uh, what the attorney did, whether he was diligent. And all, I argue that the record shows that Mr. Kinsey was diligent. He filed the motion to dismiss within 24 hours of its deadline. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a good day when we get to cite to Pinoyer versus Neff. <laughs> so, uh, Council, thank you for your argument. Um, it's a, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a straightforward issue as we were dealing with there at the end. So, thank you for that. We're going to take it under advisement at this time, and we will rule in due course. Thank you.